Hi, my name is Andy and I am part of the staff team here at Heart Church and I'm so glad that you've tuned into church today. Thank you for being here. And on this New Year's Eve, as we prepare ourselves for stepping into 2024 and all that God has for us, we're going to be having a chance to stop and focus our attention on God through worship and a short thought from the Bible. So wherever you are engaging today, we pray that this service will be a blessing to you.
Your faithfulness remains Your faithfulness remains Your faithfulness remains Your faithfulness remains All your faith
Welcome to this New Year's Eve at Heart Church. And if I don't see you before you see this, may I take this opportunity to wish you a very happy and prosperous New Year. I don't know about you, but when I grew up, and for me it was in the northeast of England in the 1970s, midnight on the 31st of December was a time rich with family and cultural traditions. Everyone would stay up to see in the new year with a table prepared, groaning with party food and alcoholic beverages, ready to welcome anyone who chose to turn up at our door in the middle of the night. And we used to do a thing called first footing, based on the idea that everybody wanted the first person who crossed their threshold in the new year to do so with goodwill. And to this end, my mum would send her little boy out into the snow with his grandfather to wander round for half an hour and return when we heard the town hall clock strike midnight to enjoy a piece of fruitcake and a piece of strong cheese. I think that that's a Northeast England thing too. And a drink of sherry. And for some inexplicable reason, we had to bring a piece of coal with us. And woe betide you if you hung around too much after midnight and were beaten to the punch by that nasty neighbour from number 43 who never entered anywhere with goodwill since 1957. I wonder if you had any similar or perhaps wildly different practices where you grew up. One thing I've noticed that many churches across the world seem to be doing recently at this time of year is called a crossing over night service, marking the crossing over from one year to the next. And I can see the point in that. It is indeed a gift from God in creation that he chooses to give us so many moments in our lives when we can draw a line and mark a fresh start. He's established the universal order in such a way that we don't live our lives in one continuous procession of moments, but we can leave behind the past with every new day, every new month, every new year, and with the addition of the establishment of Sabbath rest with every new week. Sadly, for most of us, much of the time, all that these opportunities provide is the chance to be reminded once again that unless something changes, everything stays the same after we cross over any such line in the sand. However new the year is, no matter how sincere the desire for change is in the hushed moment of the altar call or the fervent promise of change, same old, same old is often the sad refrain by February, by the second week in the month, by Tuesday, by lunchtime. Today, I'd like us for a few moments to focus, to reflect on a people, on a generation who didn't just cross over, they entered in. They entered into a life full of the fulfillment of all of God's promises and to think about how their story might help us as we cross over into 2024. Let's read from the word of God. In Joshua chapter three, we read this. Early in the morning, Joshua and the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went through the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are, move, you are to move from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves. Tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. You've never been this way before. Consecrate yourselves. The Lord will do amazing things within you. Stirring words. We join God's people here as they near the culmination of their epic journey from slavery in Egypt to the fulfillment of all of God's promises to them. In the story of this journey, we have read of them being enabled by God's work through Joseph at first to find place of safety in Egypt when their survival was threatened by a terrible famine. 
We read that over the course of 430 years, as generations passed, their place of safety gradually became a place of slavery until eventually a Pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph, who saw them as a threat and after treating them more and more harshly, sought to limit their reproductive potential by ordering the murder of every male baby by the midwife delivering them. We read of the rescue of Moses as a baby and his adoption by Pharaoh's daughter as he grew to manhood, his growing indignation at the plight of his people and his demand backed by God's authority that Pharaoh let my people go. And eventually, after being blessed with a huge amount of gold jewellery by their erstwhile masters, we read how miraculously they crossed over the Red Sea. We read of the destruction by God of their enemies. We read about the people then grumbling that they wished to return to Egypt where they missed the onions and garlic without cost. Without cost? Really? We read about God giving Moses the Ten Commandments and about the Israelites while Moses was up the mountain receiving the commandments from God, worshipping the golden idol that they had made from the jewellery that was given to ease their entry into God's promise, which meant that when Moses returned, he ground up the golden idol and they had to eat it. We read in the story about the sending of 12 spies into the land of God's promise, among whom only Joshua and Caleb gave a report that didn't only reflect the size of the challenge that faced them, but also reflected the greatness of God and the significance of his promise and his power. That's Joshua and Caleb, who were then threatened with death for their temerity, or rather for their trust in God. We read that it took 40 years of wandering around the wilderness, led by pillars of cloud and fire, fed from God's food directly provided by him before they were ready to enter into all that God had promised. 40 years to travel a distance that should have taken them three weeks. 40 years walking around and around the same mountain. And now here, as we join their story, the story of the 600,000 men who left Egypt, only two of them remain alive, Joshua and Caleb, along with their wives and children and the descendants of the others. Over the next few minutes, I want to focus on what happened next. Now, you may well ask, what's all of this to us? Surely the story of the killing of the first Passover lamb, the escape from slavery, the long passage through the wilderness, the entry into the promised land, is all just a foreshadowing of the work of Jesus on the cross, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Surely we, Christians, are already in the promised land, the kingdom of God. And indeed we are. God's kingdom is in us. We have been redeemed. And that redemption will be completed when we are transformed into our glorious resurrection selves in a new heaven and a new earth. But scripture gives us their example. It points to the fact that it is possible for us to be set free, to cross from bondage to freedom, from death to life, to be saved and still not enter the fulfillment of all that God has promised and stored up for us that it's possible for us to cross over through wilderness experiences, all the while being guided and nurtured and protected by Almighty God and still not enter into the fulfilment of the promises of God, not inhabit fully the kingdom of which we are joint heirs with Christ. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And continuing in verse 11, these things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, 
be careful you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you, except that which is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. An example to us, in what way? Well, let's look as we prepare to cross over into 2024 and see what we can learn from the story of God's people as we encounter them here, about to enter into the fulfillment of God's promises. When we meet them in this scripture that we read earlier, they'd crossed over before, when they'd crossed over the Red Sea out of the clutches of the rampaging Egyptian army. But then they were just running away from a place of bondage and hardship. They had not crossed over anticipating anything other than rescue. Perhaps that's your story. Have you been saved, rescued, but now to, you find yourself in a strange place, wondering, is this it then? They'd crossed over before, when they crossed over the wilderness. But that had taken them 40 years, when it should have taken them three weeks tops. And their journey was characterised by the manifestation of divided loyalties and the pursuit of agendas of jealousy, power struggles, division, rebellion, unbelief and fear. And for many of them, a desire to return to the safe limitation of familiar bondage. Perhaps we see echoes of ourselves here, going from struggle to struggle. God's goodness on display everywhere in his guidance, guidance and provision. But why, oh why, is it taking so long to taste the fruit of the land flowing with milk and honey? And now they were about to cross over again, led by Joshua over the Jordan. But how was this going to be any different? What had they learned how had they changed? How come this time, when they crossed over, they would end up in the promised land and enter a season of the fulfillment of all of God's promises, unparalleled in human history so far? What was so different about this Joshua generation? And what might that mean for us as we cross over into 2024? Firstly, I'd like to ask, what did they leave behind? They left behind the bondage of Egypt. But you know, places of limitation are sometimes all we have known. They had to choose to leave all that was familiar to them in pursuit of a promise from God of a better life. Are you ready to do the same? They left behind the comfort of Egypt, onions and garlic without cost. The cost had actually been enormous. Forced labour, the loss of their beloved children, a life entirely lacking in freedom. But the comfort of the familiar is indeed enticing. And they knew that God was not offering them comfort, but challenge. They left behind the gods of Egypt, the things that they had worshipped. They left behind the gold of Egypt, the things that they had put their trust in. They had made that gold the gold that they'd been blessed with into a golden calf and worshipped it. And that gold is still there in the wilderness. You could find it in the ossified remains of the latrines they had dug, mixed with fossilised excrement. They had to leave it behind. There was only one God who could give them what they needed. They left behind the mindsets and attitudes of Egypt, represented by some people, some expectations, some preferences, some dreams. They had to leave behind a life of grumbling, but doing nothing about it, a life of capitulation and limitation. So they left behind some old things. What new things did they take with them? They took an awareness of their own insufficiency and a trust in the sufficiency of God the fruit of hard lessons learned in captivity, in their rescue and through the wilderness years. Having crossed over the Jordan, they did indeed consecrate themselves. They re-established the Passover meal intended to remind them of his ability to rescue them and to point forwards to the powerful sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which sets us free. And then more painfully, they circumcised themselves and waited while they healed 
before they marched onwards. They waited in full view of their enemies, just a few miles away in Jericho. They knew that they had no chance without God's help. And so truly, they consecrated themselves and trusted him. And instead of rushing out and slaughtering them, the army in Jericho spent weeks growing more and more fearful of these strange people who God had brought across the impassable Jordan. They took with them an acceptance of God's way of doing things and a rejection of rebellion against it. They took with them gratitude for the blessings of God, which allowed them to live in confident expectation that he will provide as you trust and submit to him. They took with them the kind of strength that comes through adversity, the kind of humility that comes through the knowledge that without God, all will be lost. So they left behind some things to enter in. They took some things with them to enter in. And what lay ahead? Victory! That sounds great. But victory would require 14 years of hardship and challenge. The challenge of being a human with all of your feelings and thoughts, anxieties and temptations on a, a seemingly impossible mission in uncharted territory. The challenge of being faithful to a promise made by the unchangeable God. 14 years of having no choice but to trust God. What lay ahead was the best Old Testament example we have of the kingdom of God, a Joshua generation. We read in the book of Joshua, chapter 24 and verse 31, Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Think about that. Israel served the Lord throughout his lifetime until the last one of those who had crossed over was gone. What about us? What about you? Saved? Rescued? Perhaps. Receiving guidance and nurture from God through every life crisis. Praise God! But aren't you ready? Isn't it time to consecrate ourselves, to set ourselves apart for a special purpose, trusting only in his power, his might, his grace, his loving kindness, as we cross over this boundary between the old year and the new. Let's cross over believing that the time of entering in is indeed at hand. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this example that shows us that we can be rescued but not enter in. That shows you shows that we can be provided for and guided and led and protected but not enter in. That shows us the way that shows us the way through recognising our own insufficiency and the sufficiency of your love and your power that was manifest on the cross to help us, to make a way for us, to enable us to take a hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of us. And as we enter in to 2024, we choose to leave behind what you want us to leave behind. Holy Spirit, reveal whatever it is to us. We choose to take with us what you want us to take with us. And we know that what lies ahead is a beginning, not a completion. But we look forward to it with joyful anticipation because we trust that he who is promised, he who has promised is faithful. Thank you, Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Happy New Year, everybody. Before we head into our celebrations today, I would like to say thank you for joining us. If you would like to give 
to Heart Church today, whether that be your usual tithes or a one-off gift, you can do so by heading to heart.church forward slash giving. Thank you for your generosity. As a church, we're going to be starting 2024 with something we call In the Fast Lane. So from the 2nd to the 4th of January, that's for three days, we'll be praying and fasting as a church, putting Jesus first at the start of 2024. We have a prayer meeting each day, 7 a.m. online and 7 p.m. at our city site location. We would love to see you there. And finally, church, we'll be gathering at Kings Meadow Campus next Sunday, that's the 7th of January. And then the following week on the 14th of January, we will be meeting at the Albert Hall in the city centre. For more information on In The Fast Lane and our services that are coming up, you can head to heart.church forward slash events. As we finish our service, I pray that God's blessing will be over you all. And I'm praying that 2024 will be a year where you would know Jesus closer and see him clearer than ever before. Amen. Enjoy your New Year celebrations. And we'll see you in 2024, church.